we're looking at five functions of the ecclesia or the local assembly of believers that come together and form what we often call church, but I like the word assembly. It's, it's believers coming together. And we've looked at the first function of the ecclesia is to make disciples and those disciples should grow into Christ likeness, being fruit bearing trees in holiness with right doctrine, countering that which is false and the bad influence and, and getting rid of it and dealing with the false teachings that come in, holding each other accountable and submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And if we do that, we come into holiness and we start to walk holy and therefore we become worshippers and, and worship is the second function of the ecclesia that we're looking at. The question that I want to begin with is what is worship? There are churches that pride themselves on being churches where they have excellent worship. And what they mean by that is the worship is so good, the meaning that the music was just so excellent and people experience this kind of euphoria. And that is not worship. You know, when people come together and they say, oh, that worship was amazing. They mean it made me feel amazing. And worship, true worship is not about me, it's about God. So that when I'm judging worship by how I felt and how it touched me, I'm not really worshipping God. I'm really um, exalting in the impact it has on me. And there's a self-interest there. Worship is not singing a bunch of songs. And it's not having great music. The nature of worship is a, a sanctified life that lays itself down for the sake of the Lord. If we go to Romans chapter 12, it starts with the word therefore, building on the whole first 11 chapters. And it says, I urge you based on that, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship or your reasonable service. That word spiritual there is the word logikin. And logikin means reasonable. The, our faith is a reasonable faith and our worship is reasonable and it's reasonable in light of the first 11 chapters of Romans that God's wrath is poured out against ungodliness because we all sinned, we all deserve judgment, but God has made a way not by the law, but by what the law was pointing to in sending his son as the perfect sacrifice to take the punishment for our sin on the cross. And yet God, even though he's made the gospel the means by which we get saved through faith alone, yet he has not um, disregarding his promises to Israel as a nation. But what he does is he saves a remnant of that nation. And through that remnant, he then makes a way for us Gentiles to come in. And so God is fulfilling his purpose for Israel as a nation. But not only that, but he hardened the nation, a great portion of the nation, in order that we Gentiles who believe may come in. And that hardness is for our salvation, but our salvation then provokes them to jealousy. But at the end of that... God finds a way to bring the rest of the nation, the remnant of the nation of the end time back into their own olive tree. So he hardens them to show mercy to us and he shows mercy to us in order to show mercy to them. And the complexity of these 11 chapters, which are so dense, lead Paul at the end of it to turn around and say, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable are his ways. In other words, Paul's saying, I have understood so much of the gospel. I have expounded it in such a dense way, and yet I'm just scratching the surface. His ways are unfathomable and beyond searching out. And in light of that, he says, therefore, I urge you by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Meaning, it is the reasonable thing to do. I love the hymn that says, um, When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain 
I can't but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. And the last verse says this, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That word demands there is not because God is there demanding us, you better do this. But then when we contemplate what God has done, the price that has been paid, the value that he's put on us, it is only right that we should give him all. He gave all to us. Therefore, there is a moral imperative for us to respond in like manner and give all for him. That's what he's saying here. It is reasonable for us to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. In light of what God has done, our imperative is based on God's indicative. God, we do because God has done. And it would be the most ungrateful, the the, the height of ingratitude not to do such when we consider what the Lord has done for us. It is reasonable and it's our reasonable service. My translation says service of worship. But the Greek word is latreian, which means worship or service. It means both. And this is the thing that worship is not coming together on a Sunday morning to sing songs to God. Worship is a a crucified life, a life that says no to sin. When I say no to sin and I fight temptation, I worship God just by doing that. When God is saying, do this and I obey him, I am worshiping God. When I um, allow my my private time my, or my um, my leisure time to be intruded on for the sake of the kingdom. I am worshipping God. That is worship. And so when I live that and I come together on the Sunday and I sing, it's an expression of the worship that I've given to God in the week. Worship is not mere escape from life. Worship is the outflow of a committed life to God. And we are to corporately worship. We are to corporately express that worship. I want to read Colossians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. This means that there is participation. I need to speak. And how do I teach and how do I admonish? It says with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the, through him to God the Father. That I teach even when I sing a song to the Lord With thankfulness in my heart. It's got to be in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Yeshua. The Lord who saves. It's got to be according to who he is. His character. And his finished work. His work and his teaching informs my praise. That what I sing should be in accordance with scripture. It's in his name. But it's with thankfulness. There is a heart of gratitude and that becomes very very important when we come into adversity that we cultivate worship adoration and gratitude to the Lord it's one thing to worship God when things are going well it's another thing to worship God when things are not going well when I have adversity when Job was being tempted and and being tried it was all because of a discourse between God and Satan. And God said to Satan, if you consider my servant Job, there's no one like him on earth. Satan's accusation was this, of course he's going to honor you and fear you. Because you put a hedge around him, nothing better happens to him. You blessed him. Of course he's going to do that. But if you take that hedge away, he's going to curse you to your face. And so when when Job was tried and he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He was proving that he really did love the Lord because he wasn't serving God for what he could get out of God. 
but we're serving God because God deserved to be worshipped and honoured and obeyed. And so it is a very special um, worship that we give to the Lord when we are in times of adversity because it just blesses the Lord's heart to see how we are committed to his kingdom and his ways and to that which is good and eternal and perfect and beautiful even when the things of life are against us. And at the end of it, God honoured Job so much that he restored everything back to him double to what he lost, even his own children. He got he lost seven children, but he gained seven more. It was double for even though he lost his seven children, one day he will see them again. And so we need to corporately express that worship to the Lord because by doing so we teach one another we are to corporately worship in a way that blesses the Lord's heart because it's according to his character with the right attitude attitude matters if we have if we do everything begrudgingly disgruntled because we'd rather do something better with our time than come together and sing praises to the Lord but we feel compelled to because people look what are people going to think of me if I'm not coming to the church meeting that doesn't bless the Lord's heart if I'm giving reluctantly but I, I feel like people are going to judge me if I don't give so I'm going to give into the offering plate God doesn't accept that when you give you must give cheerfully not begrudgingly because God loves a cheerful giver we corporately pray. If we go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, it says this. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If we jump down to verse 8, it says, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Verse 8 teaches us that the context here is not personal prayer. I pray my closet, but the prayer we pray when we come together. Because when we pray together and we lift up those hands, Paul's saying, I want those hands to be lifted without wrath and dissension. That when we come together, we're not bickering and arguing and then lifting our hands up to God. But when we lift our hands to, go, to God together, it's in the character of Christ. Without wrath and dissension. Without falling out and bickering and arguing. Unity and prayer should go together. And some people might wonder, well, no, I understand praying to God. Because I pray to God and I've got a relationship with God. But why would praying together make, you know, why would it be necessary? Why is it so important that we pray together? Is it that God can't hear my prayer if I pray by myself? So he needs lots of people to pray. Do my prayers become more effective when there's tons more people praying together with me? But if we understand that the prayer and the unity must go together. There's something significant about the body praying together because it's an expression of the unity that the Lord prayed for in John chapter 17. That that unity has to be evident in our worship together and our prayer together. And as we pray together, we're united together. And therefore, um, we manifest in Christ because Christ must be manifested not only in me as an individual, but in the body if he is to be manifested in his fullness. And therefore, praying together is absolutely necessary. And why is it in churches that we find that there are certain people that do all the praying, but other people very shy and reluctant to do so? I don't think people should be made to pray against their will or forced but I do think we should be encouraging each other to pray. That we can put our amens to the prayers of other saints as we hear them express the very things in our own hearts. Sometimes you feel something and you just don't have the words to express it. But sometimes when you hear a song or a poem or somebody else praying, it somehow gives you the words to express what's in your own heart. 
So if that person doesn't read that poem or sing that song or pray that prayer, you're robbed of the articulation that you're looking for. God has given us a body for a reason. And we're to be dedicated to that body. Corporately expressing worship, corporately praying, but then there is to eat the Lord's Supper. We see in Acts 2 verse 42 that the early church was committed to four things. When I say committed, they were devoted. They're devoted to teaching, which those of us who believe in good Bible teaching, we emphasize that to the nth degree, that I'm not going to that church because they don't have the teaching of the word. It's all milk. It's all froth. I'm not getting anything decent out of this. But it's not the only thing we're to be devoted to. We're also to be devoted to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. And the breaking of bread, what did it mean in that context? They were breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together with gladness. The eating together in that Middle Eastern context, as I've said in the teaching on breaking of bread, is to form a bond of commitment and loyalty. To have that communion with God and with one another that though we are many, we are one body because we all partake of the one bed. It's also part of the unity that God is formulating in the body. It's very interesting that when you have family over, do you not eat together? Eating together is very much part of being community and being family. So if we don't really experience that in the body, we're not really living as family. And the whole thing of eating together is not so that we can have a meal together, but the, the centerpiece of those love feasts, of that celebration, is the Lord's Supper. That this is not just a feast for the sake of having a feast, but this is a feast in order to remember what the Lord has done. And it is a rehearsal, a dress rehearsal for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Normally, when you have a wedding, you will have a walkthrough of that wedding so that everyone knows what place they're to position and how they're to walk in so that when it actually happens, it goes smoothly. Well, every love feast that we have is a dress rehearsal for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's a foretaste of that which is to come. And it is to excite us and to make us desire the coming of the Lord even more. The last prayer of the church in Revelation chapter 22 says this. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last and the beginning and the end. And then it says in verse 20. He who testifies these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Twice the Lord emphasized, and even three times, because in verse 7, he says, I am coming quickly. Three times the Lord says, I am coming in the last chapter. And what's the last prayer that's in response to that? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, which is the word Maranatha. Celebrating the Lord's Supper in a meal, should whet our appetite for the coming of the Lord and the marriage supper of the Lamb. In 1 Corinthians 11, we see the early church, in, not just in Corinth, you see elsewhere, they met together on a Sunday evening and they broke bread in anticipation of the Lord's return. What does it say? You, for Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're preaching the death of the Lord until he comes. And he's coming in the night. What part of the night is he coming? Let's be ready. Every time we share this together, we build the bond of unity with the Lord and with one another. We worship together. The Lord's Supper we are to partake of together. And I would add that biblically, the pattern that's set for us, it's, it is in the context of a meal. And there's something very significant about that. And there's something we lose by divorcing communion from a supper. When we turn the Lord's Supper into the Lord's snack, we lose something. But all of this is to glorify God. If we look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21, it says this. Ephesians 3 verse 21 says, I'm going to go from verse 20. It says, Now to him... 
who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That verse 20 is so important because God does more than we can ask or think. And it's according to the power that works within us. And if it were not for that power that works within us, we would not be able to glorify him in the church. Because the glory of God is only, God is only glorified by that which portrays his character. Moses prayed, Lord, I pray you show me your glory. And when God showed him his glory, he said, you'll see my back, but you will not see my face, but no one can see me and live. And as he caused all his goodness to pass by, he declared, he preached, he proclaimed the name of the Lord, the character of God. That is the glory of God. It is his essence, his character, his goodness, his holiness, the fact that he punishes sin and the fact that he shows forgiveness. The fact that he is loyal and steadfast in his love. The fact that he is faithful. This is all part of the glory of God. And so therefore, he is glorified in the church when the church itself manifests that character. And that church can only manifest that character if it is the power of God that is at work within us to form it in us. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you for a part, and you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so discipleship is necessary for worship to be classed as true worship in order that God may truly be glorified. And as we are experiencing that in the body, we discipleship and worship then must be expressed in the activity of building one another up. And that's the third part that we'll look at in the next session. The third function of the Ecclesia is edification. Thank mm-hmm. you.